לאבותינו ולנו, שלא אחד בלבד עמד עלינו לכלותנו, עמד עלינו לכלותנו. והיא שעמד על אבותינו, והיא שעמד על אבותינו ולנו. I'm living in Betel and I will be glad if you will come to visit me here in Betel. <laughs> Herbie Dan, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I was a baker lawyer in Memphis. I, have, I used to go open up, the, go to work at six o'clock in the morning, go change clothes at eight and go to court, oh and then go back home. We made Aliyah in November 11th, 86. We've been in Beit El since August 29th, 1988. Opened the bakery up in Erev Rosh Hashanah, 89. Beit Dale is about uh, between 1,200 and 1,400 families. It's one of the bigger yeshuvim in, in, the, in the Shomron. This is the place for Jews to live. It is the place. Um, it's not all about money. It, I probably could have made a better living there than I can here, but this is the place for us. First of all, welcome to Beit El. I'm so glad that you can join us. We are atop the water tower in the town of Beit El. If you can look around, you'll see north, south, east and west, every direction. There's a beautiful view of the land of Israel. We're not stopped by buildings, by other mountains. The mountain of Beit El is over 900 meters above sea level, so that's why you could really see everything. I want you to focus for a minute on this mosaic map. Now this is a biblical map of Israel. I'm just going to step in here for one minute. You'll see that over here is the Mediterranean. This is the Jordan River. We're looking north, north, south, east and west. And along this mountain range, you'll notice all the holy biblical cities of Israel, starting in the south from Beersheba, that's this red dot, that's where Abraham lived. As you move north, you get to Hebron, where the Machpelah Cave is, and our, almost all of our forefathers and foremothers are buried. And then as you move north, there's Jerusalem right here. And of course, that's our holiest city. North of Jerusalem, you'll see right on this dot, that's Beit El, and that's where we are now. If you continue moving north, you'll see Shiloh, where the tabernacle stood for 369 years, and Shem, which is Nablus in English, that's where Joseph is buried. You can keep moving up the same mountain range, and you'll get to Tiberias and Sfat. This mountain range is... Uh, really the main highway of biblical times. That's where everyone traveled. You can't travel in the valley where it's muddy in the winter. There were no paved roads. And you can't travel to the east of the mountain range because 
In the winter there are flash floods, even today. So on the road that you, Ezra, traveled getting here from Jerusalem, was that's really the same road that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joshua and Jeremiah and all of our prophets and kings and queens walked and traveled with their with their donkeys and their camels on the very same road that you traveled today. So that's very exciting for us. It's interesting that even though this is one mountain range, the mountain range changes at around Bethel. South of Bethel, in the direction of Jerusalem, everywhere you look you see cities, towns, trees, agriculture. And north of Bethel, you see almost nothing. Bare mountains with a little bit of white dots here and there. And the reason is that the mountain range changes at Bethel. South of Bethel, it's a very flat mountain range, which is very convenient for cities, for agriculture. And north of Bethel, it becomes very hilly, very steep. Even during ancient times. So you have very few villages north of Bethel. We say that Bethel is the connection between north and south. And not just because of the topography. Bethel is also the connection between two kingdoms. During the time of uh, the first temple, Israel split into two kingdoms. The southern part, with Jerusalem as its capital, be became the kingdom of Judea. And Jerusalem was the center, and the Holy Temple was the center. But north of Bethel, it became the kingdom of Israel, with Jeroboam, Yeruvim, as the king. And he rebelled against Jerusalem. So from Bethel northward was the northern kingdom. So we are a connection between two topographies, a connection between two kingdoms, and we're also a connection between the three main patriarchs, between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Abraham was given the blessings of God on a mountain called Bar Har Baal Hatzor. Abraham split the mountain when he made a covenant between himself and God. And he didn't just split the mountain, he split the animals, everything was split. I want you to look over here and you will see just northeast of us there is a mountain that is split into two. And the mountain side on the right you'll see a little listening device from the Israeli Air Force. Looks like a little white bali. And on the left side you'll see some agricultural and some walking paths. That is the split Baal Hatzor mountain and that is where we believe Abraham received his blessing and promises from Hashem, from God. Isaac was given his blessing southwest of us in the area that was called Grar, which is today sort of Kiryat Malachi, it's in the Gaza Envelope area. And th that's where Isaac Yitzchak was given his blessing. Jacob, Yaakov Avinu, was given his blessing right here in Bethel. And if you look at a map of ancient Israel, you can draw a line directly from the Baal Hatzor mountain where Abraham received his blessing to Grar where Isaac received his blessing and it will cut through Bethel. Now, from Abraham's mountain, you can see almost the entire land of Israel. It's about 100 meters higher than we are. It's over 1,000 meters above sea level. And you could really, as God said to Abraham, look north and south and east and west. All of the land that you see, I will give to you and your children. You can see almost everything from that mountain. And from Gerar, you can see almost the whole, all of Israel, too. From Har Hatzor, you can't see Isaac's mountain. And from Grar, you can't see Abraham's mountain. Why? Because Bethel's mountain, Jacob's mountain, is too high. But it connects both of them. It's the connection between the promises God gave to Abraham and the promises that God gave to Isaac here in the mountain of the promises God gave to Jacob. Our forefather Abraham, his main character trait was loving kindness. We think of him as having his tent open to guests from all four directions. Our forefather Isaac, his main character trait is Dean, judgment. Uh, he, was, he was one with the law. He followed the law exactly. And our forefather Jacob, his character trait was Tiferet, which can be translated to beauty or truth. He was the balance between loving kindness and judgment. He was the one that brought the two of them together in beauty and in truth. So if you think about that, this place, Bethel, is a connection between topographies. It's a connection between kingdoms. It's a connection between the places where God gave blessings to the forefathers. It's a connection between the characters of our forefathers. 
And if you imagine that ladder upon which Jacob had his dream, where he received his blessings from God, it's a connection between heaven and earth. Right now, what we're looking at is the place where we believe Jacob dreamt his famous ladder dream, upon which he was giving promises to God for Jacob and for all generations. You can see there an ancient stone structure. It's actually two structures, and that's about over a thousand years old. And to the right of it, there's a flat area that perhaps looks like a parking lot from this distance, but it's actually bedrock. And that is the rock upon which we believe that our forefather Jacob dreamt his dream. We're going to be walking into this gate and entering the area where Jacob himself had that latter dream where God gave him four promises. Come on in. This is a holy site. What we see when we first come in is this double structure of stones and we see this ancient tree which I'll tell you about in a moment and we see this bedrock, huge bedrock. I want you to notice, first and foremost, that there's a piece of the bedrock that's standing out. You could see it stands out from the rest of the rock. This rock is flat and it's clear that this part of the rock stands out. Now look at the shape of this. What does this look like to you? Hmm? A lot of people say that it looks like the state of Israel. It does kind of look like the state of Israel. You can see a lot here at the tip and maybe Jerusalem around here, and this is Haifa, and that's the Golan and the Galil. But this isn't Biblical Israel. Biblical Israel is much larger than this. But can you also see that it's sort of the shape of a person? The feet over here tapered at the bottom, and then widening as they get to the hips, and the shoulders over here, and here would be the head. Many people have told me that this sort of looks like the shape of a human person. We don't know for sure. Nobody was here. Nobody is alive today from the time of Jacob's magical dream to be able to tell us that this is 100% certainly the place where Jacob slept. But there's so many things that point to this spot and I'm going to share some of them with you. First of all, let's open the Tanakh. And let's read what the story is. I'm going to be reading from Bereshit, Genesis, Perk Kafchet, the 28th chapter, verse 10. Vayetze Yaakov mi Beersheva, vayelech Harana. And Jacob left Beersheva and he went toward Haran. Vayifga b'makom, vayalen sham, kiva ha-shemesh, vayikach mi avne ha-makom, vayasem meroshotav, vayishkav b'makom ha-hu. And he touched the place and he decided to sleep there because the sun was going down. And he took from the stones of the place and put them under his head and he lay and to sleep in that place. Vayachalom. And he had a dream. Vihine sulam mutzav arza verosho magia hashamayma. And there was a ladder standing firmly on the ground with its head, its pinnacle, reaching the skies. And angels of God are going up and down this ladder. And God was at the top of the ladder. And he said, I am God, the Lord of your father Abraham and the Lord of Isaac. At this point I'm going to stop and tell you that this is when God gave Jacob four holy promises, four divine treasures that we today are seeing come to fruition. It's an incredible thing. This is the first one. Ha'aretz asher ata shochev aleha lecha et nena ulazar acha The land upon which you are lying I will give to you 
and to your children after you. Now if you think about the size of a bed, that's not such a big promise, but our commentator Rashi, one of the greatest commentators on the Tanakh, explains that all of the land of Israel folded under Jacob to become a part of this promise given to our forefather Jacob. Meaning, if this is the shape of the land of Israel, and this is the rock upon which he was lying, then all of the land of Israel was included in this promise to Jacob that the land will be given to Jacob and to all of his descendants after him. Here's the second promise. And your children will be like the dust of the earth, and they will travel north and south and east and west. And if you think about it, that's what happened to us throughout the generations. Throughout our long 2,000 year diaspora, we went north and south and east and west. And the continuation of the second blessing is And all of the people will and all of the nations will be blessed through your family's seed. Which means during the time that we were scattered all over the world, those that were good to the Jewish people became blessed. And those that were not good to the Jewish people became forgotten. Once you turn your back on the Jewish people and you stop blessing them, you will no longer be the superpower of the world. Here comes the third blessing. Are you ready? Hine anochi imach ushmarticha bechol asher telech. Here I am with you, and I shall watch over you wherever you go. God was telling this to Jacob, who was running away from his brother Esau, who wanted to kill him. So God is saying to Jacob, don't worry, I will be with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. But this blessing is also for Jacob's children. And if you think about it, we wandered the world for 2,000 years. So many nations tried to kill us, humiliate us, stomp us out, tax us to death, or obliterate us from history and yet none of them succeeded. I think the most recent perfect example is Nazi Germany because the Nazis as we know were very organized they had a wonderful plan they called it the final solution and they were so successful at everything they did and yet they were not successful at their final solution. Unfortunately they killed many many Jews way too many Jews but their intention to obliterate the Jewish people, they were not able to succeed in. Because God promised Jacob, I will watch over you wherever you go. And the Jewish people have succeeded and thrived and survived. And here we are today. Here comes the fourth, and in my opinion, maybe the most emotionally moving blessing, certainly for people that come here to Beit El. This one says, Hashivoticha el ha'adama hazot ki lo e'ezavcha ad asher im asiti et asher dibarti lach and I shall return you to this land and I shall not leave you until I have fulfilled this promise that I have made to you. I shall return you to this land. Where are we standing? Where are our feet? Can you imagine that we have the incredible privilege of being returned to this land to be a walking fulfillment of the promise given to Jacob 4,000 years ago? It's an incredible privilege. Especially when you think about the fact that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, in the 1860s when Mark Twain came here, he was blasted as a blasphemer because he said this land is in uninhabitable. Nothing grows here. Nothing can ever grow here. He did us a favor by recording down that this land was wasteland. And anyone that comes to Israel today will tell you what a beautiful, thriving place it is, both in terms of the flora, the fauna, the agriculture in terms of the technology, in terms of the medical breakthroughs, and certainly in terms of the Jewish people that have come home. A few psukim later, just a few verses later, 
ג'קוב וייקס אפ, ויקץ יעקב משנתו ויאמר, אכן יש השם במקום הזה, ואנוכי לא ידעתי. ג'קוב awakes from his dream and says, God is in this place and I hadn't realized it. ויירא, and he becomes afraid. ויאמר, מה נורא המקום הזה? אין זה כי אם בית אלוקים, וזה שער השמיים. He says, how awesome this place is. It is none other than a house of God and the gate to heaven. We talked about that connection between heaven and earth. וישכם יעקב בבוקר, and then in the morning Jacob wakes up. ויקח את האבן, אשר שם איך ראשותיו, and he takes the stone which he had placed under his head. וישם אותה עם מצבה, ויצוק שמן על ראשה. And he makes it into an altar and he pours oil above it. ויקרא את שם המקום ההוא בית אל. ואולם לוז שם העיר לראשונה. And he calls the name of that place בית אל, the house of God. And the name previously had been לוז. I want to go back to this rock that we talked about. Now, I don't know how many of you were paying close attention, but we, we, if, you, if you go back and listen, Jacob collected a number of rocks and put them under his head. And when he woke up, there was one rock under his head. Our commentators explained to us that the rocks combined to one. And this rock, the part that is standing out, is actually a conglomerate. What is a conglomerate? It's a, a number of rocks that have been welded together, usually on the ocean floor, and usually because of a millennia of water weight. But in this case, overnight, rocks joined together into one, the ones that were under Jacob as he slept in this place. Hello, my name is Shirel Dahan. I learn in Bitter Institute. I live in Jerusalem. It's uh, a beautiful place with more than 300 students who learn Torah all day and all night. And I invite you to come visit. A very nice place in Yudavi Shomron. very special tree. It's a wormwood oak tree. In fact, it's the oldest wormwood oak tree in all of Israel. They estimate it at about a thousand years old. Common wood oak trees are, as they sound very common, wormwood oak trees are not common. They need a, a height of at least 700 meters above sea level in order to grow. And as I said, we're over 900 meters above sea level. Um, this very special wormwood oak tree comes up again in the Tanakh. In Bereshit, Genesis, Perek Lamed Hay, the 35th chapter, the first verse, God returns to Jacob and speaks to him again. After he's already been married to his four wives, most of his children are born. Listen to this. Ve'yomer Elohim el Yaakov, kum ale betel, v'shev sham, 
ויעשה שם מזבח לקהל הנראה אליך, וברכה מפני עשיו אחיך. And God says to Jacob, Rise and go to Bethel and settle there and make an altar to the God who appeared to you while you were running away from your brother Esav. So we were here already. He was running away from his brother Esav and God appeared to him. God says, Return. I'm going to skip a few verses in which God, uh, Jacob tells his family, We're going to a holy place. You must purify yourselves. You must rid any idols that we have in our possessions. Let's go. Now I'm at verse 6. Pasuk Vav. Vayavol Yaakov Luza asher be'eretz k'na'an. Hu hi bet'el. Hu v'chol ha'am asher imo. And Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. He and all the nation which is with him. Remember how we said earlier that the previous name to Bethel was Luz? We meet it again. We're coming back to Luz, which is Bethel. And do you know that this is the very first time that the Jewish people are referred to as a nation? Makes sense. Abraham was an individual with two sons one of whom he gave the blessings to. Isaac was an individual with two sons, one of which he gave, the blessings, he gave the blessings to. Jacob had 12 children, and all of them received the blessings as a nation. So when Jacob and his wives and his 12 children, 13 including his daughter Dina, returned to this place, it says he and the nation that was with him. And let me continue. Vayiven sham mizbeach, vayikra lamakom kel betel, ki sham niglu elav ha'elokim babarcho mipi achiv, mipnei achiv. And he called the place, oh he made an, and there he built an altar, and he called the place the God of Betel, because that is where God revealed himself to him when he was running away from his brother. Vatamat dvora mineket rivka. And then Deborah, the nursemaid of Rebekah passed away. We're not talking about the prophetess Deborah. We're talking about the young woman who helped raise Rebekah when she left her father Lavan's house, her father Betuel's house, to come marry Isaac. She came with her nursemaid, who must have been a very special person. Also because she's mentioned here by name in the, in the Tanakh. But also because we know that Rebecca's father was an evil man, her brother was an evil man. How did she turn out to be so wonderful? Well, she must have had a very special nursemaid. And this nursemaid, Deborah, passed away as Jacob and his family came here to Bethel. Vatikaver mitachat le Bethel, tachat alon, vaikrash mo alon bochut. And she was buried just below Bethel, just below the oak tree. And the oak tree was called the oak tree of tears. And here we are with our thousand-year-old wormwood oak tree. Clearly she wasn't buried under this wormwood oak tree because the story happened 4,000 years ago. And this sweet tree is only, only a thousand years old. But I don't know if you could see, there's a baby wormwood oak tree right here, another baby wormwood oak tree that they've got protected over here. These are probably around 50, 60 years old. Around the corner, there's a beautiful young wormwood oak tree, 250 years old, that's just growing so beautifully. You could see how old this tree is. It even has, uh, we had a tree doctor come and put things to stabilize it. But this oak tree sends its seeds nearby. All of its seeds are around it. It doesn't send its seeds to the four directions of the wind. So we know that although this isn't the wormwood oak tree below which Deborah, the nursemaid of Rebecca, was buried, we know that it's probably the great, 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 great grandfather tree because all of the little seeds are growing right next to it. So adjacent to the rock upon which Jacob returned, where he dreamt and was given promises by God himself, Deborah was buried below the wormwood oak tree. Uh, my name is uh, Gershon Zekbach. I have born in Haifa in the year 1936. 
I uh, come here two years ago because my wife died and I have here a, a son and daughters. I am very happy to live here. We have Achnasat Sefer Torah. Many, many people come here and uh, it was uh, like really a nice uh, simcha. So we have also many, many uh, uh, cultural things that so it's uh, very nice to live here in Beit El. I have also more uh, children that live in Judah and Shomron. I have one uh, girl, one uh, daughter that live in Kuchava Shachar and uh, uh, one uh, daughter more that lives in Karmei Tzur. It is uh, like uh, near to Hebron. Uh, I have uh, all together 23 grandchildren and I have eight grand, how you say grand grandchildren? Great, great grandchildren. Grand grandchildren. Uh, all of them are living only in Judah and Shomron. They live in Har Bracha, they live in uh, Alon Shvut, uh, in uh, Alon More, Alon More, and so on. Uh, I think they live in uh, Judah and Shomron is much more better than in the near the sea, down old Israel. So I have to, I hope many, many peoples come here and live here and are happy. Careful though, please be careful. And there's prickles. Do you see this dirt road that's leading over there? That's the road to Jerusalem, the biblical road. And the mountains haven't changed. That's the road to Jerusalem. This is the first of four olive oil presses. This is the simplest one. You see, this is the one from the first temple period. You can see that there's a, a large hole where the olives were placed. Large rocks were placed above them to release the oil. And then there's a little tributary that leads to this area where the oil was gathered. That's the easiest, not the easiest, but it's, it's the most natural way to get out olive oil, and that's what they call virgin olive oil, from the first press, the best quality olive oil. Here is the second olive oil press. This used to be one round um, piece and with a, a stick in the middle, and you would place the, uh, the olives, after they'd been pressed this way, you would place them here and wait would be placed upon it. There are many examples of this around Israel. Usually donkeys or mules walk around pushing this heavy, heavy stone to press down on, on, the, on the olives. And they brought out the second best quality olive oil. The third of the four is over here. You can see there's a, a spot for a some sort of a wooden beam to be put over there and pulled over here and here there's a hole in the ground. So if you pressed hard enough by putting weights on one end of the beam it would squish the, the what's left of the olives from the seed and the, and the skin of the olives. It would press them even further and more oil would be taken out. And you see what we have here? Huge heavy stones with holes in them. These were the weights. These were the actual weights that were used to pull down the wooden beams in order to put more pressure on the olives and extract even more oil out of them.
spring here and where uh, we came from Ramat Gan and uh, it's, uh, we, we came here with uh, have, having fun before before Shabbat and that's it. Enjoy Eretz Yisrael! This is the land of holy, so uh, please come here. This is your home. <laughs> come to Israel. We want you here. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> 